Okay, so I told you there's some other clues that help us with depositional environments with sedimentary rocks. So I'm going to run through those really fast. And so we're calling these structures. And one of the first ones, and this was kind of in the video that you'll watch if you haven't watched it already, it talks about what's called bedding. And so we see when we look at big, thick deposits of sedimentary rocks, if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon is a great example, but you see these layers, and this is bedding. In general, it's kind of interpreted as a stoppage in deposition is why there's this little bed there, and then it continues to deposit. And so we get these thick beds or layers, and whether they're thick or thin can tell us something about the depositional environment. And the argument, of course, is that in general, they're deposited horizontally. We said if something's different, they're tilted or something, that can tell us something about what's occurred here. So we want to look at the bedding. So are they all the same color? Do they vary in color? Are they super thin? Are they super thick? Do they have a thick and a thin layer? This can tell us something about the depositional environment. And so sometimes when you get alternating layers of different colors, it can tell us something about seasonal deposits or the very thin muds. And a lot of times in lakes, you get seasonal deposits because you get more carbon rich stuff in the fall that degrades, gets washed into the lake, and so it's more carbon rich, and then in the springs you get more sands and things like that. So it can tell us something about an environment. Uh, let's see. So graded bed is a, a particular type of bed, and so as you look at the bed, you'll see that there's larger pieces at the bottom of the bed, and they get smaller as you move up to the top of the bed. And so usually the indication for this is that there is a change in velocity. So remember, the argument is that in order to move something this big, this little white piece right here, I need a certain speed. Okay, I, And I can't move anything bigger, but as my velocity increases, I can move bigger stuff. Move means it, it keeps going. As I slow down the velocity of the stream, let's say, I start to drop out these pieces because I can't move them anymore. But the very tiny pieces, they can continue to be transported away somewhere else. And so remember, my river has velocity. It's moving everything that's this size and smaller. As soon as that velocity gets just a little below that and it can't move these big pieces, they fall out and they rest on the bottom of, let's say, this is a riverbed. And then as it continues to slow, it drops to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's telling me that the velocity is decreasing over time. So kind of an example of that is this. Or what we would see a graded bed, a great place, is in a floodplain. So this image here is showing a river that runs through here, but it has overtopped the banks and flooded out this flat area called the floodplain. And so when it first overtops, it has velocity. And it rushes out here and it brings a mess of stuff, big, small, everything. But as it fills up this low-lying area here, it starts to become like a lake and the velocity drops. And so initially it drops out the big stuff, like here, and then more big stuff, and then it runs out of big stuff, and then it's the small stuff. And so you can get this graded bed suggesting that there's a velocity change. So we know rivers can do that. We can get wind deposits that do that. And so it's just a little indication of potentially what might have occurred in the environment to give us this structure. A big graded bed, right? So this could be a big flood event, right? Here comes the raging water. It's moving really big stuff because it's super high velocity. We'd argue that it's water because the pieces are rounded. And so, but over time, the velocity has decreased and given me these smaller pieces toward the top. Another thing to be aware of is that in these big, huge floods, we can deposit a thick sequence of material in a short amount of time. So we're going to take that in consideration when we're interpreting the rocks. What else we got? Okay, ripple marks. This is a surface feature. So if we look today on either sand dunes or in water, we see these little ripples have developed. And so we could say, oh, ripple marks might mean a desert. Or maybe it means a little side of a stream or something like that. We look at a couple different types when we look at the rocks. Because we see two different types occurring today, and we find two different types in the rock record. So how do we interpret those? We have 
a group that's symmetrical. So in a side view, they look the same. The slopes are the same on either side. And what this suggests is that the water or wind was moving back and forth. And so if I see symmetrical ripples in a rock, I'm thinking, what environment has that? Could be maybe a beach. Waves come up, waves come back, waves come up, waves come back. That's a reasonable interpretation for that. And that because sands can be in a lot of places, maybe that helps me with my depositional environment. Or even a lake. As the wind blows across the lake, it kind of sloshes up and back a little bit and give me symmetrical. It tells me a back and forth motion. Okay. And so if I look at other ripples, what I see is they're not symmetrical. They're asymmetrical. So they have a very long, gentle slope and then a very steep slope. And that tells me one direction of movement. So this might be more appropriate for a river that's flowing right, in one direction or a desert where the wind is blowing in just one direction. So I can use these to narrow down some of my environments. Because like we said, sand, there can be lots of environments. These could help me narrow down what environment I deposit those rocks in. What else we got for you? And so here's some ripple marks. So there are surface features, so along the bedding plane. So sometimes they're exposed. Other times we could crack them open, or the pry bar, and then we'd look at the surface and we could see that. So it depends. It's a little hard depending on the shadow, but this kind of darker suggests that's a little steeper. So there's a gentle and the steep side that would suggest motion in that direction. So we could get direction of flow. And look, if this is a river interpretation and direction of flow, then I can tell you which way the river was flowing. So I can tell you where the mountains were and what direction the mountains were because the river flows from high to low. And we could talk about what the mountains were made of because that's what's composed in my rock here. So there's lots of cool stuff we can pull out from the rock if we can look at these sedimentary structures and interpret them properly. Cross beds are a unique feature. So look, we said that beds are horizontal and they typically are. But cross beds are unique in that if we look at a layer of sedimentary rocks, we can see that there's this angle here. A lot of times you could see there's a break and there's a slightly different angle. So it's not that these were tilted. These were actually formed during deposition. And look, the video that you're going to watch, I think, does a really good job, even though it's a very simple animation of showing you how these form. But it's this idea that as material is moved across to an environment and it's deposited, it actually avalanches down. And so let me just kind of define this. So here's the bed. These are the cross beds that we're going to say are formed here. Really big cross beds, one that measures over a meter, are typically associated with uh, sand dunes, like a Sahara Desert type environment. But you can get these in deltas and in streams, but they're usually smaller, and so that can help us. So let's say we're looking at a, a desert environment. The dunes themselves can get really big. What we see is the wind pushes the sand up to the very top here, and then it gets kind of unstable as the sand kind of builds up right here, and then it slips down the steep face and forms this angle deposit instead of flat. And the good news is, is that they kind of show us which way the wind or water was moving because they're steeper at the top and they start to flatten out at the bottom, pointing in the direction that the wind or water was moving. And so, wind can do it, water can do it. A lot of times as a river moves into a ocean or a lake, it forms a delta. What that means is it has a lot of material and then it drops the velocity, so it dumps a lot of stuff there. But the river or the ocean or the lake is a lot deeper, so it slides down to the bottom and it forms these cross beds. In sand dunes, where we have a change of direction, we could get that and we could identify that. In a delta, we would expect pretty much a, a kind of one direction, but there's a stoppage or an erosional event that occurred between these beds, but still telling us the direction of flow, which is what we want to get from our cross beds. Some tiny cross beds, you know, I wouldn't call these big sand what big sand dunes because they're small. But look, you should be able to tell me what direction was the water moving. If I look at this cross bed, what we want to identify is 
it is steeper here and it starts to shallow and flatten out. So it is pointing in the direction of flow. So for this, flow is from right to left across the screen here. All right? Let me go back just to confirm that, right? So this top part's kind of cut off, but you can see it gets flatter and flatter and flatter. Think of the sand avalanching down this bed here all the way to the bottom. And so you want to be able to look at those and identify directions. So remember, cross beds are a side view thing. I need a road cut to see cross beds. Ripples are a surface feature that we would identify. Okay. What else we got today? So look, uh, if you've been to Zion, those structures that you're looking at are very large cross beds. And these indicate a Sahara type desert that existed there because the cross beds are so big. What else I got for you? Mud cracks. Mud cracks, just kind of what you'd expect. So this is what mud cracks look today. This is what they look in the rock record. They tell us that this is a semi-arid environment, right? So it's not a tropical rainforest. There has been rain and then there's been periods of evaporation that allow the rocks to kind of uh, the muds to shrink up. And then I deposit some sand and it fills in the cracks and flattens it out and that gets preserved. So that's what mud cracks can tell us. And then finally, of course, fossils are a great tool to tell us what we have. And that can be either uh, a fossil that's a body fossil or a trace fossil that doesn't include part of the animal. It's just a trace from it, like a footprint. But look, you don't have to be a fossil expert. If you see shells in a rock, you're probably not going to think, oh, that must be from the desert, right? It's either freshwater or seawater, but at least you can know it's some type of water environment. And if you knew what shell it was, you say, oh, those live in the ocean, so this must be an ocean deposit, right? So we can do things like that, so you don't have to be super expert you just want to do oh you know this is a footprint from a, a creature that walked so it's probably not a fish or if i found a fish i would say oh that must be from you know the ocean so it helps us you know kind of clarify what the different types of things we have right so okay gosh these things get long okay so look the idea is if i was to identify a, a depositional environment called an alluvial fan this is a deposit that we see a lot in Arizona in the southwest where we have mountains and material that gets washed out of the mountains and deposited in the valleys in the low-lying areas. But look, it's close to the source. What does that mean? It should be poorly sorted, angular, big pieces, fragments of things might be preserved in there, right? But I wouldn't expect there to be beautifully bedded sandstone in here, right? Big angular pieces. Breaches really common in this kind of deposit. And so if we looked at that, we might say, oh, if we saw this, one possible explanation could be an alluvial fan, right? A deposit near a mountain front. Never traveled any further than that, got preserved, voila, there we go. Rivers. Rivers can have a bunch of different stuff because they're kind of complex. But gravels, sure, sands, muds. In the river channel itself, higher velocity, I would get sands and gravels in there. They would be rounded, though, because they've traveled. So no breccias, but conglomerates, right? Lower velocity stuff in the floodplains, this is where the muds are. But can I get ripple marks? Sure, because I have direction of flow. Cross beds? Sure. Graded beds? Yeah, because we get this change in velocity. Mud cracks? Sure, out in the floodplains. And then we could get fossils here that are associated with this type of environment. Put all those together, we'd say, this is a river deposit. Uh, what else we got? And of course, they can be a variety of things. Muds, but all these pieces are rounded. This is not an alluvial fan because they're rounded. But a change in velocities, depending on where you are in the river system, would tell us that Wow, we're in these really fine stuff. This is part of the floodplain. You're in these big pieces here. This is part of the channel where there's a higher velocity. We'd look for fossils and things like that. Tie all those things together, and we could interpret that as a river deposit. Oh, my goodness. Uh, sand deserts, remember, cross beds are the key to most of the deserts. And, of course, mostly quartz sandstone so we don't get muds here we don't get big gravels because wind is a great sorter of material 
And so we just get the sand size things there. We should see big cross beds, maybe some trace fossils. But large cross beds, greater than a meter, is usually a good indicator you have a desert environment. Dry lake beds, right? evaporites are here, right? Because we have high evaporation rate. Water comes in and then it dries up, comes in. So halite, gypsum, we're looking for those type of sedimentary rocks. Um, that's the kind of things we would see in uh, playas and things like that. It'd be in the Death Valley, right? There's lots of salts being deposited there. And so mud cracks for sure. So this tells us a different environment, some lake beds. And then deltas, whether it's going into the ocean or to a river, we wouldn't expect to see gravels. Why? Far from the source. This is the end of the river. It's traveled for hundreds, if not thousands of miles. Those pieces have broken down super small. And so when they get to the ocean or the lake, they're going to dump all the material there. We're going to see graded beds because there's a change in velocity there. Lots of muds and sands, cross beds, ripple marks. Yeah, because we have a direction of flow. And we look for some plant fossils that we might expect to find in these low-lying areas. Things that could handle maybe uh, some brackish water where there's some seawater and fresh water. We could interpret that as a delta deposit. Oh golly. And so we're going to rush off to what else? Shallow marine. Big one here is limestone. And so when we're in the Bahamas, we tend to get lots of carbonate forming because all the creatures here are creating their shells out of calcium carbonate. All the coral reefs are calcium carbonate. When they die and break down, they form calcite and calcium, uh, calcium carbonate muds and sands, and those things can get cemented together and form limestone. So we could look for all these things because we do have these things in the ocean, right? We have ocean currents, so we have movement, things like that. But the big thing here would be carbonate, which would tell us the environment of deposition, we would typically just say shallow marine, but we think Bahamas, kind of stuff like that. And then deep marine, once we get way out into the deep ocean, there's not a lot of debris being washed out that far. So what we tend to get is what's called a uh, the church that we talked about, because way out far in the oceans where it's deep, the critters that are pulling stuff out of the water here are making silica shells that are super, super tiny. When they die, they all fall to the bottom, and that silica is the source of the silica that makes up these bedded silica layers that we would call chert. So if we see these chert layers, it's an indication of very deep marine. So there's no muds or sands because we're so far from the continent, not drifting out that far. And the source that we see here is typically just the silica from the creatures that have kind of bit the dust here. Okay, holy crapola. So a lot of stuff, but the idea here is that you could look at a sedimentary rock, determine if it's chemical or clastic based on some observations. If it's clastic, you go through the process of size, sorting, what they're made of, and then you look for any type of structures. You take all that information together and you try to puzzle out what environments might have that. Okay, so quiet water environments, lakes, right? Playas, things like that. High energy environments. These are alluvial fans near the source where things are rushing down a mountain front. Rivers that are near the source have a high velocity. Smaller pieces, lakes, deltas, rivers that are far from the source. Lots of sand, could be a beach, right? Uh, could be a desert. We would look for different cross beds and things to help us with that. So it doesn't have to be perfect. The idea is that. If I gave you a sandstone, the first thing you might think of is a desert or a beach. I like it. That's a potential correct answer for that. Could we figure out which is which? Well, it depends. If we do have some cross beds in there, or if we had some ripple marks in there, that could kind of eliminate one and confirm another. But we want to just pick a reasonable interpretation based on what you see. And so you don't have to be perfect when we do that. But it is telling us the story, and that's what we want to get out of the sedimentary rocks. Okay, hopefully that's not too much for your brain, and you will be fine. And we have one more, one more metamorphic rocks, and then we can move on to other cool stuff. Okay.